This is NHK World Japan. We bring you the news from Radio Japan at 11 hours UTC on Monday, June 24th. I'm Eriko Kojima. And I'm Hiroko Kitadai. In our top stories, police in Japan are implementing the highest level security measures for the Group of 20 summit, which starts on Friday. South Korean government sources say U.S. President Donald Trump is considering a visit to the demilitarized zone between the two Koreas during a trip to the South this weekend. And former Nissan Motor chairman Carlos Ghosn and his close aide Greg Kelly have attended pre trial talks at the Tokyo District Court. Now the news in detail. Police in Japan are implementing the highest level security measures for the G20 Osaka summit, which starts on Friday. World leaders, diplomats, and members of the media will be gathering in the city of Osaka, Western Japan. Up to 32,000 police officers will be mobilized to patrol the summit venue, hotels, airports, and other locations in Osaka Prefecture. That's far more than 23,000 officers at the Iseshima G7 summit in central Japan three years ago. Police officers from across the country have been sent to Osaka to support security measures against possible terrorist attacks. Officers have already begun checking vehicles in the area of the venue. Special units outfitted with cutting edge equipment will be deployed to deal with any suspicious drones. Meanwhile, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department has stepped up security at crucial facilities, including the U.S. Embassy, as well as railway stations and other locations in the capital. Railway operators in western Japan have stepped up security at train stations ahead of the G20 summit. Coin operated lockers and trash cans were shut down at major stations in Osaka Prefecture on Monday, four days before the start of the meeting. The measures will remain in place until Saturday. West Japan Railway has suspended access to lockers and anything left inside them until then. The railway operators are asking passengers to cooperate by taking their garbage home while station trash cans are unavailable. South Korean government sources say U.S. President Donald Trump is considering a visit to the demilitarized zone between the two Koreas during a trip to the South this weekend. South Korea's presidential office announced on Monday that Trump will make a two day visit from Saturday after attending the G20 summit. Trump is scheduled to meet South Korean President Moon Jae in. A senior official in Seoul says there are no plans for a three way summit, including North Korean leader Kim Jong un. Talks on denuclearizing the North have remained stalled after the second summit between Trump and Kim broke down. The two leaders sent letters to each other this month. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has expressed hope that the talks will resume. Stephen Began, the U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, will also visit South Korea this week. There is speculation in South Korea that Trump may send a message to Kim at the demilitarized zone. Two years ago, Trump and Moon cancelled a plan to visit an area close to the border due to bad weather. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says North Korean leader Kim Jong un's remarks about a letter from U.S. President Trump suggest that the resumption of denuclearization talks may be a real possibility. Pompeo was referring to a report published by North Korea's state run Korean Central News Agency on Sunday, which said Kim was satisfied and would seriously contemplate the interesting content of a personal letter from Trump. Pompeo told reporters on Sunday that he hoped the letter would provide a good foundation for the U.S. to begin to continue important discussions with the North Koreans to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. He added that the United States is literally prepared to begin at a moment's notice if the North Koreans indicate that they're prepared for those discussions. White House spokesperson Sarah Sanders has confirmed that Trump sent a letter to Kim, but its content hasn't been disclosed. Trump and Kim have exchanged personal correspondence before meeting in the past. You're listening to Radio Japan of the NHK World Japan Network. Former Nissan Motor Chairman Carlos Ghosn and his close aide Greg Kelly have attended pre trial talks at the Tokyo District Court. The carmaker and the two former executives have been indicted on suspicion of under reporting Ghosn's pay in the firm's securities reports. The talks were held behind closed doors on Monday. The participants included the prosecution and lawyers for the three accused parties. 
They're likely to have discussed when the prosecution will disclose evidence to support its allegations. Gon's defense team is believed to have asked the prosecution why Nissan President Hiroto Saikawa has not been indicted. Gon's lawyer says the pre-trial talks are expected to continue until around next spring. Gon has flatly denied the charges against him. A chairman's statement issued at a meeting of ASEAN leaders in Bangkok says they took note of some concerns about the South China Sea. Beijing has been stepping up military activities in the waters. The statement was issued after the ASEAN summit ended in the Thai capital on Sunday. The document says the leaders discussed matters relating to the South China Sea. It says they took note of some concerns on the land reclamations and activities in the area which have eroded trust and confidence, increased tensions, and may undermine peace, security, and stability in the region. ASEAN nations are not aligned over the South China Sea, with some hoping for economic cooperation from Beijing. The chairman's statement issued after the ASEAN summit two years ago did not include the word concern, apparently out of consideration for China. This year's statement also says the leaders recognize that the global economy is in, at an important crossroads with an increasing number of uncertainties and challenges. The statement also indirectly referred to the issue of Rohingya Muslims who fled Myanmar's western state of Rakhine to escape persecution. The statement says the leaders expressed their support for Myanmar's efforts to ensure safety and security in Rakhine, facilitate the voluntary return of the displaced persons, and realize sustainable development in the state. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations says it's aiming to jointly host the 2034 FIFA World Cup. Thai Prime Minister Prayut Chan-o-cha gave a news conference after the ASEAN summit. Prayut said. The leaders supported the shared wish of ASEAN to develop a joint bid to host the FIFA World Cup in 2034. He added that he wished to invite all ASEAN people to collectively support the national football associations of ASEAN member states and realize this dream together. Soccer is popular in ASEAN countries with fans of all ages. The Vietnamese men's squad, in 96th place, is the highest ranked among member states in FIFA standings. ASEAN members say details still need to be worked out on how to jointly host the event. If it goes ahead, it will be the first FIFA World Cup in Southeast Asia. Turkey's ruling party, led by President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has lost again in a repeat mayoral election in Istanbul. Turkish media say Ekrem İmamoğlu, the candidate of the main opposition party, won 54 percent of the vote, with about 99 percent of ballots counted. He won the Istanbul mayoral race for the second time. His opponent, former Prime Minister Binali Yildirim of the governing Justice and Development Party, or AKP, conceded defeat in a speech. In Turkey's local elections in March, the AKP suffered major setbacks in mayoral races in the capital Ankara and the country's largest city of Istanbul. Turkish election authorities ordered a rerun of the mayoral election of Istanbul won by İmamoğlu after the AKP complained of irregularities. The move triggered fears of political turmoil and caused the country's currency to plunge. The lira fell to its lowest level since last October. The AKP's second defeat in Istanbul apparently reflected voters' dissatisfaction with Erdogan's 16-year rule against a backdrop of a slow economy and oppression against opposition politicians. Erdogan congratulated İmamoğlu on Twitter, saying that Turkish people have again expressed their will. He stressed that he will work hard to maintain stability of the country. Hundreds of thousands of protesters took to the streets of the Czech Republic's capital Prague on Sunday, urging Prime Minister Andrej Babiš to resign over fraud allegations involving EU subsidies. Protest organizers say an estimated 250,000 people joined the march against Babiš, a billionaire sometimes called the Trump of the Czech Republic. The demonstration is seen as the biggest since the 1989 pro-democracy movement that brought down the communist regime in the former Czechoslovakia. Earlier this year, police concluded that Babiš should be indicted for illegally receiving about 2.2 million dollars in subsidies from the European Union while he was in business before taking office. 
but the justice minister stepped down immediately after that, and a politician said to be a close ally of Babish was appointed to the post. Local media last month featured a draft EU report pointing out the ongoing relationship between Babish and a corporate group that had received the funds. The developments have brought growing criticism of Babish, but he has categorically denied the allegations and any possibility of resigning. The new right wing party, led by Babish, enjoys a certain level of support thanks to the robust economy, making it unclear if the demonstrations could lead to the end of this administration. People in northern Thailand have marked the anniversary of a miraculous rescue. Twelve boys and their soccer coach were trapped in a cave for more than two weeks last year after monsoon rains flooded the area. Their ordeal captured the media spotlight and drew rescuers from around the world. Specialized divers mounted a dangerous operation and, against all odds, managed to bring the boys out safely. The boys returned to the cave entrance with their families on Monday morning to offer prayers. They also paid tribute to Saman Kunan, a former Thai Navy SEAL who died in the rescue operation. The cave itself remains restricted for safety reasons, but the area around it has grown into a tourist attraction. Since the rescue, the number of visitors has skyrocketed from 40,000 a year to 1.3 million, many of them Thais. Meanwhile, authorities are taking steps to avoid further misadventures. The cave is expected to remain closed for at least another year while a lighting system is installed. And there may be restrictions on how far people can venture inside the cave when it does reopen. People in Indonesia in East Timor were jolted by a magnitude 7.5 earthquake Monday morning. It struck near the Indonesian coast in the Banda Sea. There are no immediate reports of damage or injuries, and there's no tsunami threat. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Center says the focus was estimated to be about 220 kilometers under the seabed. Google is partnering with the Japanese bank to keep smaller firms up to date on the latest advances in IT. It's an area where the companies can lag behind and one that's essential amid the country's shrinking labor market. Google is teaming up with the Bank of Fukuoka in western Japan to hold seminars for small businesses. They'll be available for free for companies wanting to step firmly into the digital age. Smaller local firms lag behind major corporations when it comes to taking advantage of technology. This includes functions like cloud services to store and share information. Google will also teach firms how to keep their IT abilities current. The company plans to offer similar seminars in other parts of Japan. Shiga Prefecture has begun surveys of Lake Biwa amid increasing global awareness of plastic pollution. On Sunday, about 150 volunteers from Moriyama City waded through the shallows of the lake, scooping up bags and other plastic waste. Plastic bags have already been a problem for the lake. Research by Kyoto University has found microplastics in the lake's fish. The latest survey aims to analyze the source of the waste and understand how, to, how it was carried there. And that was the news from Radio Japan of the NHK World Japan Network. I'm m a r i k o Kojima. And I'm Hiroko Kitadai. Thank you for listening. Please stay tuned. <laughs>